Well, I'm Nelson McDaniel. I'm a member of Christ Church, and I am in a series that they are doing called Beloved Community. And they have been kind enough to ask me to talk a little uh, uh, about uh, the African American community in New Bern. And I, uh, at our last, in our last episode, our first episode, I talked about the, the, the community uh, from uh, early on in the late 17th century on uh, into the mid 19th century. And of course, with anything like that, you're doing a, a, a wide survey. And I tried to make the point in, in, in part that it bothers me that we talk about the history of the African American community because there is no such thing as the history of the African American community. There's the history of the community. But sadly, because many of the stories, uh, many of the incredibly rich stories from the African American community were systematically removed from the telling of our history, particularly during the Jim Crow period and during the first half of the 20th century. So that many of those stories we are rediscovering, we are reinterpreting, we are telling once again. And, uh, and it is so important because without the whole story makes no sense whatsoever. So even though most of the people about whom I will talk are African-American, there is much the part of everyone's story, uh, as are, of course, the white people or the people from any other ethnic tradition. It is one community, and no matter what efforts people make to suppress some stories, and those efforts were made, then uh, thank goodness there are people who will try to bring those stories back so that we know the truth as best we can tell it. Historians uh, know that they're always in the process of finding and interpreting the truth, but we want to do the best that we can. Well, what we talked about the last time was that New Bern was remarkable in that it had not only an enslaved uh, black community, but it also had a very prosperous and prominent free black community, one of the most important in the South. And uh, so that through the 18th century and into the 19th century, we see these prominent free blacks as well as the enslaved community. The free blacks fought in the American Revolution. Uh, they were prominent business owners. They participated in civic affairs. Now, not to suggest that there wasn't hierarchy, not to suggest that there were no aspects of racism because there were plenty. And of course, where we saw that most forcefully was in enslaved community. And the enslaved community uh, in this area was also substantial. And those slaves were owned by white families, but also by prominent black families. And of course, we will always, to our shame, have to live with that as part of our history. I also talked about the fact that there were people in the community who knew, who knew that slavery was an evil institution. Many people who did. It wasn't that we were totally unaware of the, the, moral, the, the moral implications of slavery, but the economic, the economic attractions were so seductive that people were willing to overlook the moral implications in order to gain uh, the benefits of, of the uh, economic bonuses that came with having uh, this enslaved labor. Really quite tragic. It's not hard for us today, as we live today, we realize that in our own lives, we are constantly making decisions that we know are not just that happened to benefit us. It's very hard to get away from those decisions, no matter how hard we try. So uh, we need not be hypocritical, uh, but we do need to tell the stories with some accuracy and all as best we can find it, and also to recognize the horrible injustice. Now, during the 18th century and the early 19th century, the free black community here thrived. And you even had in North Carolina the right to vote uh, if you were male and owned property and were free. Uh, 
uh, you could vote. There was not a color bar in the first North Carolina Constitution, but in 1835, a new constitution was written and a color bar was added and blacks in North Carolina, no matter what their status, were disenfranchised. Banking laws were changed. And from 1835 on until the Civil War, it became much more difficult for black families to accumulate wealth, to own property, to do all of the things that became associated with the acquisition of, of generational wealth and many of the freedoms that had even been enjoyed uh, before 1835 were lost. So that as we approach the Civil War, things in many ways have become much more difficult, both for free blacks and for enslaved blacks in this area. Now, on the eve of the war, New Bern was reasonably prosperous. Uh, there had been some economic downturns in the mid 19th century, but still New Bern continued to be one of the most important cities in the state. It vied with Wilmington uh, as a very important town with a population of about 5,000, which uh, in the mid 19th century was a sizable town for anywhere in America. Of course, there were bigger cities like Philadelphia and Charleston and, 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 and New York and Baltimore. Uh, in Boston. Those were larger cities, but they were larger uh, by relatively small multiples compared with what we think of today. So on the eve of the Civil War, with a population of about 5,000, New Bern, with its new railway, because the railway, they had begun constructing the railway through here, the North Carolina Railway in 1854. And with that railway, Newburn became a very attractive target for Union armies because along that railway, through the use of that railway, many supplies were delivered to Confederate forces. They would come in through Moorhead, which was a new port. Beaufort is a much older city than Moorhead, but Moorhead was a relatively new port, greatly expanded because of the railroad. And then uh, those goods would be shipped along the railway in the direction of Goldsboro and through Newark. So the uh, northern forces understood that to capture Newark was to cut off an important supply route. So in 1862, in the winter of 1862, under General Ambrose Burnside, they came down to Roanoke Island, and then from Roanoke Island, they came across the sounds. And when they uh, uh, reached the mouth of the Neuse River off of Pamlico Sound, they came up the Neuse River and anchored off of what is today Cherry Point, Havelock, Broken Creek, came up the creek, and eventually they did an amphibious landing there, one of the first, if not the most important, one of the first significant landings, amphibious landings, in American military history, rather prophetic when you think of the fact that it's right where Cherry Point Marine Air Base is today. And then they marched up the railroad tracks, those same railroad tracks, they marched up those railroad tracks to about five miles south of New Bern, where the Confederates had built fortifications uh, from the river, all the, from the Neuse River, all the way to the Trent River, along the Neuse River. And they marched up those railroad tracks to those Confederate fortifications, which were mostly earthworks, hand-dug earthworks. I might say that thanks to the Newburn Historical Society, uh, 28 acres of those earthworks are preserved today. The best preserved redans and earthworks among the best in the whole country. Those original earthworks dug by those Confederate soldiers. So in March of 1862, in a one day battle, the Union forces attacked uh, that spot along the railway. And because of the peculiarities of the topography, and because of Bowen's Branch, which was a creek that flowed into Bryce's Creek that flowed into the Trent River, 
uh, the earthworks had been built in such a way that there was a gap in between. And taking advantage of that, the Union forces were able to get behind those earthworks and the battle was completed in short order. And the uh, Southerners uh, were driven from uh, those earthworks and retreated towards the west, across the Trent River, across Price's Creek, retreated west, and by nightfall, the northern forces had taken all those points and were crossing over into New Bern uh, by boat. Uh, and now there was no, there was a railroad bridge which had been set on fire. And by the way, that original railroad bridge from the 1850s, some of the supports of the current railroad bridge right there next to New Bern's farmers market, some of those supports uh, are the original ones that were put there in the 1850s. But they burned the wooden trestles of the railroad bridge, and so many of the northern troops were coming into New Bern by water. There was, uh, at that point into New Bern, there was no uh, uh, bridge for wagons and for troops. The two at both uh, uh, Pembroke uh, uh, plantation which was the, home of the, the Nash family, and at the Spate Plantation. And there were bridges across the Trent River, but not right at Newburn. So the troops came across. And by nightfall, you had, in fact, the story was that many of the white Southern families had deserted their homes so rapidly and taken the last train out of Newburn that the food on the tables for dinner was still hot and the Yankee troops came in and ate that good Southern food. Now, whether that's true or not, but it's a, it's a rather colorful story. We do know that a lot of people had fled and that then Newburn was occupied or depending on your point of view, occupied or liberated for the remainder of the war in spite of at least three attempts to retake it by the South. Now, the implications of that occupation were huge. It said much of the white population fled. North Carolina had always been a mixed state, a state with divided parties. There were many North Carolinians who did not want to secede from the Union. There were families that divided, that had, had uh, 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 sons within their families fighting for the North and fighting for the South within the same family. Even in Newburn, there were divisions among families. But uh, with the entry of the northern troops, many of the families who could afford to get out of town did. And their houses were taken over and used to house troops, along with important camps that were built. For example, many of us know the playground, Fort Totten. It's called Fort Totten because Fort Totten was a Union camp right at that spot. Uh, occasionally, uh, although I think most of it's gone, you'll still people out, see out people out with metal detectors trying to find a few, a few remaining artifacts. But thousands of troops then came into, uh, into Newburn and uh, lived here for the remainder of the war. General Ambrose Burnside set up his headquarters here uh, in a couple of different houses, the John Wright Stanley House, uh, which many people know is part of the Trine Palace for Restoration, and a couple of other houses uh, in, in, uh, in, in New Bern, which also became his important headquarters during, during the war. The other effect, though, tremendously important effect of that occupation was that if enslaved blacks in eastern North Carolina could make their way to New Bern, and eventually to Beaufort, because from New Bern, an expedition went down the river and eventually reached Beaufort. And all of this little strip from New Bern to Beaufort was liberated and was under Union control for the remainder of the war. So if enslaved blacks from other parts of Eastern North Carolina could make it to this area, then they were considered contraband and they would not be sent back to the plantations or to their owners, wherever they had come from. Now, when I say they were contraband, some people confuse and think that, well, if they could get to Newburn, they were free. They were not free. 
This is prior to the Emancipation Proclamation, so they were not legally free, but they were contraband, and it was against the law to return goods, whether it was a mule, or whether it was a plow, or whether it was a human. Goods that were owned by rebels were to be confiscated and not returned to those rebels. So the practical effect was that these enslaved blacks knew if they could reach it to New Bern, they would not be returned to their owners. And here they were in New Bern, January 4th, 1863. The Emancipation Proclamation freed them, and they were then free people of color in Union territory. Absolutely amazing story. We can only imagine what that day must have meant to those people. In fact, one of the people who found himself in New Bern at that time referred to New Bern as a Mecca, a Mecca of a thousand noble aspirations. A thousand noble aspirations. Well, really, there were many thousands because by that point we had about 10,000 fugitive slaves living in the New Bern area. 10,000, more than double the population of, of the town before the Civil War. Quite an amazing story. And these people began to organize because what they found in New Bern was a fairly sophisticated free black, black population, many of whom had been leaders, leaders in business, leaders in the community. And so they knew how to organize. And so they instantly began to organize. In some cases, they used the new African American churches as the basis for their organization, most notably the new. St. Peter's AME Zion congregation, which had grown out of Andrew's chapel, which was the mother church for both St. Peter's AME Zion and St. Mary Methodist when it had been an integrated church. And that church became a focal point of organization of many of the blacks who had fled into New England. It was really quite remarkable what was happening. This gave the connection to many of the blacks in New England, particularly in places like New Haven, Connecticut. And they were aware of what was going on. And at the same time as they began to politically organize, they also began to organize as potential soldiers for the Union Army. Now the Union Army at that point was not recruiting former slaves to be soldiers, but already they were organizing the first African Brigade and they were marching, particularly on the New Bern Academy grounds, those same grounds that we see on New Street, they were marching on the Academy grounds and on the Old Palace grounds. They were marching with corn stalks instead of weapons. And they formed that first African Brigade, which would eventually form the nucleus of was to be called the 35th and some of the 36th and 37th U.S. Colored Troops. So that by the spring of 1862, as the Union Army saw the benefit of these U.S. Colored Troops, these formerly enslaved people, then they began to recruit them and train them and uh, they became part of the Union Army. Now, interestingly, as that process began, Abraham Lincoln, who was well aware of what was going on in New Bern, sent a recruiter to New Bern, and his name was Kinsey. And Kinsey's job was to try to recruit some of these people for the Union Army. And after several weeks of trying, he had recruited two, two people. And yet, there were thousands and thousands and thousands here in New Bern. Now, why was he having trouble recruiting? Because the Union Army treated these former slaves, these black people, miserably. In some cases, a little better than the slave masters had. 
We forget sometimes, although we never should, that racism was as rampant in the North as it was in the South. And so these people were treated in a very inferior way and they were not joining the Union Army. Well, there was a man named Abraham Galloway who had grown up outside of Wilmington in Smithville, not Smithfield, Smithville, which is today called Southport. He was a prominent white man. His mother was an African enslaved woman. And so, because slavery followed the mother, he was born enslaved. But he escaped and he made his way to Canada and he made his way from Canada to New England. He became very active in what were called the legal leagues, which were ardent, ardent abolitionists. And Abraham Galloway was well, well known among that community. Well, with the occupation of Newburn, he was able to get to Newburn and begin to organize these enslaved people in Newburn. Well, despite Kinsey's best efforts, people were not joining those Union forces for the reasons that I stated. Abraham Galloway, as he usually did, took things into his own hands. He kidnapped Kinsey, Lincoln's representative, and took him to a house in Long Wharf, which is over in the area about where Trent Court is today. And in the attic of that house, at gunpoint, he negotiated, if you will, the terms under which these, these formerly enslaved blacks, these fugitive slaves would join the Union Army and eventually over 5,000 joined. Over 5,000 joined, and as I say, formed the 35th and part of the 36th, 37th U.S. Colored Troops. It's an incredible story. We don't have to guess at the story any longer because Abraham Galloway, and I'll talk a little bit more about him, but he became such a well-known figure across the nation. Abraham Galloway was as well-known across the nation, in all probability, as Frederick C. Douglass. People across the nation knew about Abraham Galloway and his remarkable story. When we begin to talk a little later, about the effects of Jim Crow. One of the horrible effects of Jim Crow was not only did they destroy all this black leadership, but they had to destroy the memory of that black leadership. The memory of that black leadership. And so by the time we reach 1900, barely a person in this area or anywhere else in the nation knew the name of Abraham Galloway, even though 30 short years before he had been a well-known national figure. So Galloway was able to recruit these people. He was able to organize many of the uh, former slaves into spies. They would go behind Union lines. Now, can you imagine the bravery of these black spies who were sneaking behind Confederate lines? and serving as spies, can you, and their full knowledge of what would have happened to them had they been caught. Galloway himself made several sorties, a number of, quite a number of sorties behind Confederate lines. In fact, multiple times he was captured by the Confederates and every time he escaped. He was unable to make his way to Wilmington and, and was able to facilitate the escape of his mother from behind those Confederate lines, get her to Newburn and eventually send her to New England. You could not make these stories up. Galloway was so important to the Union effort that while he was a black man and therefore could not be an officer, he nonetheless was an intimidating figure for many of these white Union officers, both naval uh, and army officers. One of my favorite stories about Galloway, and I'll tell you where I get most of these stories in just a moment, is the bar brawl, the bar argument that he got into with a man here in a bar in Newburn with a white Union naval officer. 
And during the course of this argument, Galloway slapped this white Union naval officer. Now, this black man slapping a Union naval officer, one would assume that the outcome would be dire for Galloway. But the outcome of that event was that the Union naval officer was court-martialed by having taunted Galloway. The Union was smart enough to know the value of Galloway. So while he might not have been able to be an officer, he was recognized as a leader that had such power that it really got along without him. Many of my Galloway stories, as well as many of, of, of most people's Galloway stories, come from a wonderful book that was researched and produced by David Sosowski, one of our great state historians, nationally known historian. David, I, full disclaimer, he's a distant cousin of mine. He's a Sosowski on his father's side, but a bell on his mother's side, a good Carter County, Craven County bell on his mother's side. And David, uh, who uh, did his PhD at Harvard, but taught for many years at both UNC and Duke, and yes, that is possible. Uh, he, he taught at both universities, and David is one of our great historians. David became intrigued with the little bit that he was able to find about the Abraham Galloway story, this man, Abraham Galloway. And he spent 10 years researching the Galloway story. Very hard to find, very hard to find, because again, every effort had been made to obliterate this man's story. But thanks to David, we have this wonderful biography, Fire of Freedom, Abraham Galloway, a slave's civil war. Now, if you don't choose to read but one book about African-American history in New England, make it this one. We have a lot of good books, several of which I talked about last time and a couple more that I'll talk about this time. But this book is a page turner. I will warn you that when you start reading it, you'd best not have anything else to do because you will not put it down. You will have trouble getting out for a sandwich or a glass of water. You cannot stop turning the pages. Every page of this book, you say that could not have happened, but it did. And one day, it's going to be a great feature film. As David Sosowski says, the Abraham Galloway story defies the Southern myth that blacks could not be leaders but it equally defies the Northern myth that blacks could not be leaders unless benevolent whites taught them how. Abraham Galloway did not need a white teacher. He was a born leader. And this is his story, and I highly recommend this. Now Galloway throughout the war, played this incredible role. I mean, for example, not only was he organizing these spies and recruiting these soldiers, he was leading delegations of blacks from Newburn to Washington, around enemy lines into Washington, D.C., where they met with Abraham Lincoln at the White House. They were organizing at Andrews Chapel, which became St. Peter's AME Zion Church, and then sending delegations to meet with leaders in Washington, including the president. And in fact, we have their handwritten accounts of those visits. One man from the congregation was extraordinarily moved because when he went to the White House, he was allowed to enter through the front door. And he said it was the first time in his life that he had been allowed as a black man to enter the front door of a white man's house. And that house was the White House. And he was terribly moved by that. Abraham Galloway was not into symbols. That was fine if they came in the front door, but that was not what he was there for. He was there to demand full civil rights, not just freedom, but full civil rights for blacks in America. And this is while the war is going on. They also organized what may have been uh, the first 
uh, civil rights organization in the nation, certainly the first, almost certainly the first in the South or the state. This is during the war. And so strong was the black leadership here that working together with them, some of the whites who had come in, like Horace James, who came in through the military, uh, were able to organize and began to build places like James and to expand what had uh, uh, what, what is now the Duffy Field area, and uh, and and as as they built homes for many of these uh, these uh, fugitive slaves who were settling in Newburn. Now. Uh, Andrew's Chapel, which had been a Methodist church with whites and blacks, and Centenary had been pulled out and formed its own church. The white Methodist church became Centenary Methodist. Andrew's Chapel then eventually, through missionaries from New Haven, Connecticut, became St. Peter's AME Zion Church. The mother church, the first AME Zion church in the South. As you know, that is a very large, predominantly black congregation, denomination, all across the South. The mother church is right here on Queen Street, right across from Cedar Grove Cemetery, uh, which is where they moved after they left Church Alley up on Hancock Street and moved to that location. And it became one of the important meeting points for this new birth of freedom that was occurring right here in Newburn. Absolutely amazing going on during the war. During the war. Now, other churches began to be formed after the war out of First Presbyterian came Ebenezer Presbyterian. And I'll talk a little bit about one of the founders of Ebenezer Presbyterian who had been a member of First Presbyterian. First came St. Cyprian's Church, which became the African-American Episcopal Church, one of our most important historically black churches in uh, the Diocese of East Carolina, at that time, the Diocese of, 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 of North Carolina. So that we see this movement to black churches, which today people say, well, isn't it a shame that the most segregated hour of the week is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning when white churches and black churches assemble? And yes, we can regret in many ways that there is that segregated hour. And yet we also have to reflect on the fact that those churches gave an opportunity for the expression of freedom and for the organization of freedom that could not have occurred any other way. In fact, that continued right up as we know through the modern civil rights movement. What is the cradle of the modern civil rights movement? It is the black church. So all of that is beginning at, and, and, and much of it beginning right here in Newburn. It's incredibly, it's incredibly historic and important. Now, Alan Galloway was involved in all of that. And then at the end of the war, this man, at the end of the war, during the early stages of Reconstruction, this man ran for the North Carolina Senate and was elected to the North Carolina Senate, where he served for the next five years. And in that capacity, we believe he was the first North Carolina legislator to propose women's suffrage, to propose domestic violence legislation. And he also helped with the effort to organize schools for black young people all over the state. And there was a flourishing of many schools, many black schools in the Newburn area in the period just after the Civil War. It was an incredibly important period as young blacks began to be able to seek education, which had, for the most part, earlier been denied to them. Now we're told that Abraham Galloway himself never really learned to read or write. He accomplished all of this without it. But his accomplishments are legendary. 
1870, when he was 33 years old, however, he died in Wilmington. There's always been speculation that he might have been poisoned, uh, but no, no proof of such. But he died in Wilmington. His funeral was in Wilmington. Interestingly, interestingly, his funeral was preached by a white Episcopal rector in Wilmington. Earl Scalloway had become great friends with him. And their wives had become great friends. And so when Galloway died, his wife, who was in Dubon, but organized his funeral in Wilmington because that's where Galloway had died, asked this white funeral. And the funeral attracted over 7,000, 7,000 mourners. To that date, the largest funeral by far in the history of the state of North Carolina. This was the reputation of Abraham Galloway, a man who by 1900 had been forgotten. Not because time had passed him by, but because what was to follow, Jim Crow, had to not only destroy black leaders, but had to destroy the memory of black leaders. And that's the tragedy, one of the many tragedies, we should say. So 1870, this is a period when blacks were being elected to office. Blacks could vote. Uh, there was the beginning of a renaissance in many of the black businesses and expansion and houses being built. There was an optimism. There was a remarkable optimism. When we read the diary as I, that I cited in the last, uh, the last time we were together, I cited this diary, Recollection of My Slavery Days, and you read the optimism, the optimism of these people just after the war, because they believed that it was over, that it was over, that at last they were going to be Americans. Sadly, we know that wasn't to be. We know that wasn't to be because what was to follow was Jim Crow, which was really the second enslavement. Now, Reginald Hildebrand, Reginald Hildebrand, who taught African American studies in Chapel Hill for many, many years, once told me, and he told many people, that in the period, the 10 or 15 years following the Civil War, in New Bern, North Carolina, like nowhere else in this nation, we saw what could have been. We saw what could have been. We saw that blacks and whites, and particularly through the fusionists and even the Republicans, although the Republicans eventually abandoned the blacks, but through the fusionists and the Republicans, that could have led to an incredible story of rebirth and a rebirth of freedom in our nation. But once again, the economic benefits of having a subservient group of people led to eventually what we call Jim Crow, the Black Codes, and all of those things that we associate with the second enslavement of African Americans in this area and across the South. And make no mistake about it, it was an enslavement. And in many ways, and I, I risk something by saying this, and this is just a matter of opinion, but I would, I would, I would venture the statement that the second enslavement in many ways was worse than the first one because we had seen what could be. And the second enslavement depended on something, not only on power relationships, on creation of a pseudo-scientific myth that blacks were innately genetically inferior to whites. After the Civil War, many poor whites had found common cause 
with many blacks. If we look at the voting rolls, then we see that many of these people were voting for fusionists and were voting for black candidates. So one of the uh, serious aims of Jim Crow, particularly in this area, was those four points and those uh, and those blacks, and to separate them into two groups. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Driving a wedge, driving a wedge so that people can feel victimized and that they could convince these poor whites that they had been victimized by blacks, not by wealthy whites, then of course they could split them off and they were successful in achieving that. And in the last part of the 19th century, the effects of Jim Crow were to produce a segregated society that would for the next 50 or 60 years be the sad hallmark of our beloved South and created, in my opinion, victims among the black population, but also among the white population who were deprived of the progress and the great things that would have come had that not occurred. Now, there were stories though that were going on against the odds during this period. One of those stories, one of my favorites, is the story of a man named George Henry White. And we have a good biography of George Henry White. I don't know that I shouldn't say this, but I don't know if it's quite on the level of some of the other books I've cited, but it's good. And George Henry White himself was a remarkable man. He came to Newburn. He came to Newburn and he uh, had, we're not sure exactly where he was born, although it was here in North Carolina, and we're not sure whether he was free or enslaved when he was born. But we do, do know that he eventually ended up at Howard University and trained as an educator and came to Newburn as a teacher in those black schools that were being formed, and then as an administrator in those black schools. And at a point, he decided that he could be more helpful to his race as an attorney than as an educator. Because they wanted to study the law. Well, he found a Confederate officer here in Newburn, William Clark, who uh, was an important member of an old Newburn family, had been a Confederate officer, was an attorney, after the war became a judge, and so just a few years after the war, you have this young black leader, George Henry White, educator, who is studying for the law with his mentor and tutor, uh, William Clark, a former Confederate officer judge. You couldn't make this stuff up. He tutored him and eventually George Henry White passed his, the North Carolina bar. Now that story I won't go into in great depth, but his passing the bar was absolutely remarkable. You talk about overcoming odds, but he did it largely through the efforts of this former Confederate officer. We can only imagine what could have been if those were the voices that had triumphed instead of the voices instead of the voices of separatism and white supremacy. Now, George Henry White then became an attorney and he eventually ran for Congress. He was very active in civic affairs here in, here in in fact, he was one of the leaders in First Presbyterian Church, one of the leaders. And as such, he was one of the leaders that pushed to form Ebenezer Presbyterian, the Black Presbyterian Church, which still is right here in Newburn. Robert Johnson, many of us know, is the wonderful pastor of that church with its wonderful history going back to George 
Henry White and those leaders who pushed for the formation of that church. And then George Henry White was elected eventually to the U.S. Congress. In fact, he was the last African American from the Reconstruction era to serve in the United States Congress. When he left Congress in 1902, in 1902, George Henry White was the last black in the U.S. Congress for almost four decades. I don't mean the last black from the South. I mean the last black we had, the United States of America, had an all-white Congress for the first half of the 20th century. And George Henry White was the last of those black congressmen. And he stood on the floor of the house in his last speech and said, yes, he was leaving the floor of the Congress. But that one day, there would be blacks who returned to the hall of the legislature and that black political voices would rise like a phoenix from the ashes. Prophetic, but it would take half a century for that to happen. But George Henry White was the last here. So I urge you, I urge you to read this book, The Biography of George Henry White. And if you ever have a chance to get my friend, Bernard George, to perform George Henry White's last speech on the floor of the Congress, I will guarantee you that you will not make it through that speech without tears, because it is so powerful and so prophetic. Now, having been defeated, and by the way, his house is still on Johnson Street, diagonally across from St. Stephen's Church, one block further towards the river, is George Henry White's house. But George Henry White left Newburn in North Carolina and moved to Philadelphia, where he became a very successful lawyer and businessman and formed some towns, many of which were primarily for blacks who had moved from the south and were looking for places to live in the north. Those of you who know that Oprah, the famous Oprah, has a friend, a boyfriend, uh, named Stedman Graham. May or may not know that Stedman Graham was born and grew up in a town in New Jersey formed by George Henry White as part of his real estate speculation and providing, and providing places to live for many of these families. So when Sedman Graham came here during our 300th anniversary, and he's been back a number of times since, he expressed a great interest in George Henry White. And I thought, how in the world is this man? I mean, he lives in Chicago. You know, he hangs out with Oprah. How does he know anything about George Henry White from Newburn? And it was because he had grown up with the stories of George Henry White, who had founded his hometown. And uh, Stedman remains quite interested, not only in George Henry White, but in the whole Newburn story. Because it is, it is absolutely remarkable. So by 1900, things had become quite grim. There were leaders in North Carolina, including from Newburn, perhaps most notably Furnifold Simmons, who was in the U.S. Senate longer than any uh, North Carolinian in history. Furnifold Simmons was a powerful, powerful man. Furnifold Simmons was a Democrat. And in an effort to get the Democrat Party back in power in North Carolina at the end of the 19th century, they had to defeat people like the Republicans and the Fusionists. Now, in, in full disclosure, I'm a Democrat, and so I'm not trying to badmouth the Democrats. There's enough bad acting to go around on all sides. But in an effort to get that party back into power, they knew that they had to divide those poor whites from uh, the black voting population. And 
they were successful in doing that. And again, people like George Henry White were no longer able to hold office. The odds were so much against them that there was no way for these people to be voted in. Uh, you know, Simmons is an interesting person because he seems to have been primarily a political figure, not, not uh, in necessarily innately racist, they're certainly not more racist than most other people were at that time, and quite frankly, perhaps at this time. But he, uh, he was driven by the political ambitions of getting the Democrats into power, and he was willing to do some pretty awful things along uh, with Charles B. Aycock, who was governor of North Carolina, called the education governor. He should be called the segregation governor. Charles B. Aycock, who, as you know, has come into some disrepute well-earned in recent years. Josephus Daniels, who had founded a newspaper, the News and Observer, in Raleigh. And together, these three men and others were able to do some pretty awful things to make sure that white supremacists got the upper hand. Some pretty awful things across the state. Perhaps the most despicable, the most despicable was the creation of stories of black men who were raping white women across the state. And these stories were created out of whole cloth. But then they would be pushed as news in the News and Observer. And people believed them. And there were black men who, innocent black men, who were lynched for having raped white women. And it was made up from whole cloth. But evil can win. And it did win. And so these are some of the shameful stories as part of our past. And if we can imagine that that is going on in the early 20th century, just a scant few decades away from the time when people uh, uh, like George Henry White or even like Abraham Galloway, were being elected by both blacks and whites to leadership positions. We know how fragile, how fragile freedom is. And it was lost as easily as it had been won. Now, one of the people who was living in Newburn, one black person who was living in Newburn during those days uh, was an absolutely remarkable man who had fled from up near Plymouth, North Carolina, a plantation up near Plymouth, North Carolina, in January of 1863, when he learned about the Emancipation Proclamation. Luke Martin, who was enslaved, knew that if he could make it to New Bern, to throw off the shackles of slavery. So over a period of weeks, he came through the swamps in the dead of winter. He swam three rivers in the dead of winter, and he made it to New Bern. And so that by the spring of 1863, he could join those U.S. colored troops, those 35th U.S. colored troops which he did, and he fought, including with great distinction at the Battle of Augusti in Florida, where he was wounded and just a few weeks later was back in the fight. Luke Martin Sr. was a tough man. After the war, he came back to New Bern, and he became the minister at St. John Missionary Baptist Church, which is on Walt Bellamy Drive right there in the old Long Wharf neighborhood, across from the Newman Towers, again, one of our very important historic churches. And Luke Martin became minister at that church. He married, he had a family, he built a house. His house 
It's still on Pembroke Road, just as you're heading out towards Country Club Road, just beyond Oscar's Mortuary, you'll see a fine uh, side hall house on a nice piece of property just to the right, just beyond Oscar's Mortuary. That's the house that Luke Martin Sr. built after the war. And it was the minister at St. John's Church. Now he married, had a family. His first wife died. He married a younger woman. And he had children by his second wife, including his youngest child, Luke Martin Jr. Luke Martin Jr. was born in 1917. Now, if you do the calculations, because his father, Luke Martin Jr., his grandfather, not his great grandfather, Luke Martin Jr., who died just four years ago. Luke Martin Jr.'s father was born 10 years after Thomas Jefferson died. 10 years after Thomas Jefferson died. So he was only a little over one generation away from that. Luke Martin Jr. then was born in 1917. And if you do the calculation, his father was 80 when he fathered Luke. I used to kid Mr. Martin, who was a very, very good man, a much better man than I, and he would laugh at my joke. I don't know if he would have said it, but I used to tell him, I'd say, Mr. Martin, your father was firing live ammunition lots of places other than the battlefield. At 80 years old, he fathered Luke. And Luke died only a few years ago. And I had the honor and the privilege of knowing him. He became one of those great legendary master brick masons that came from the African-American community in this area. They were master masons. Luke Martin was the lead brick mason on the reconstruction of Tryon Palace. There are homes and buildings all over Newburn that Luke Martin Jr. built. But he was the son of one of those U.S. color trees. And I interviewed Luke Martin for public television a couple of times. Remarkable man, uh, among the wisest people I ever knew in my life. And I'll never forget asking him the question. I said, Mr. Martin, Mr. Martin, your father fought for your freedom, for his own freedom and for your freedom. And yet, by the time you were born in 1917, we were at the height of Jim Crow, the second enslavement and your freedom had been lost. How bad was it growing up in Jim Crow? And look, I will never forget these words. I remember them every day of my life, several times during the day, which is why I know I will never consider myself a victim of anything. Because Mr. Martin looked straight at me and he said, and I asked him, how hard was it? And his answer was, I had a lot of hard days. I had a lot of hard days. I never had a bad day. I never had a bad day. He grew up in the worst of Jim Crow. He could tell you stories that would make your blood boil. And yet, from his lips, I never had a bad day. Now why, why? He was the ultimate existential hero. I've never met a greater existential hero than Luke Martin Jr. Because while he might have had to live through the, the horrors of white supremacy, never allowed it. He never allowed it to define him. And he didn't allow it to define him because he knew that as long as he didn't, that he controlled his own dignity. His own human dignity was in his hands. You know, that's the strength. That's the strength 
that we should have benefited from 450 years after the Civil War. And it took us a long time to even begin to recognize it. And thank God some recognize it today. And I pity the people who don't. Because the Luke Martin Juniors teach us the tragedy of us, but they also teach us the nobility of the human spirit. And uh, I will every day thank God for having counted Luke Martin among my friends. He's buried in Greenwood Cemetery, and I still go to visit him. Yes, I go to visit William Gaston, and I go to visit uh, 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 I go to go to visit Luke Martin because these people have a depth of understanding, and that's that I can only that I can only try to begin to understand. Now, during that same period when Mr. Martin was growing up, there were also remarkable stories. I mean, if you anyone who's been to the Chelsea Restaurant in New Venice, they know that that building was built and owned by a black female entrepreneur. This is a female black entrepreneur at the height of white supremacy. And she built a number of Newburn's earliest and most important brick commercial buildings. Now by law, she couldn't go in the front door of the building that she had rented to white merchants, including eventually Caleb Bradham, who as you know, that became the second uh, uh, headquarters for Pepsi. And she couldn't go in the front door, but they all paid her rent. They all paid her rent. So we have so many stories of that sort, of these people who triumphed, again, existential heroes in the face of overwhelming odds. The Roan sisters, Charlotte Roan, and her sisters. Charlotte Roan became the first black registered nurse in the state of North Carolina. From right here in New Bern, despite her educational credentials, she was not allowed to practice until eventually, eventually doing private nursing and eventually doing other nursing. The first, the first black registered nurse in the state of North Carolina. She and her sister opened a hotel, the Roan Hotel, which still stands. It's now an apartment building up on Queen Street. It was in the Green Book. Many of you have heard of the Green Book, and there were a number of addresses in New Bern in the Green Book. Their place was in the Green Book. And it was up by the train depot because, among others, many of the Pullman porters who were on the trains that would come through New Bern had no place to stay overnight because they were not a stay in white hotels. So of course, that was the purpose of these places in the Green Book. So we could go on and on, and you probably feel we have gone on and on. But these stories are so rich, so improbable, in many cases, so heroic that they deserve to be told. So I go back to that statement by John Hope Franklin, which I alluded to in our first segment. John Hope Franklin, who was probably certainly the most important African American historian, historian of African American history in the first half, in the second half, excuse me, of the 20th century. In many ways, some people have referred to him as the W.B. Du Bois of the second half of the century. This legendary figure. And he looked at me sitting in his living room in Durham, where he taught at Duke University. And he said, many of the stories associated with African Americans in Craven County, in Carter County, are the most important in the nation. Never stop telling them. And it's our job to never stop telling them, to find more and more and more because we have just scratched the surface, to find more and more. And these are not stories that are important to the black community. These are stories that are important to all people who value freedom and human dignity because 
They are stories that are inspiring, that are painful in many cases, but that tell us about the triumph of the human spirit in the worst of circumstances, as well as in the best of circumstances. They are heroic stories, they're wonderful stories. And I am grateful for this Christchurch project, uh, which uh, here in March of 2020 has allowed me to tell a few of these stories through this, this medium. And I hope uh, that you will rush out, buy these books, and push uh, for the telling, the continuing telling of many of these stories that are so important in our history. Thanks, fun to be with you.